Hi, welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. And I'm Brian Michael. Today we have a special episode. That's not a null that's here. It's, uh, it's not Brian hey. or Kara, it's Angela and I. But uh, this is a little film series that Angela and I have been wanting to do for quite some time. It's around the world, and so uh, we just picked a country uh, that had a lot of movies, and we wanted to actually we had a list of movies we wanted to see. It was hey, which country? Let's put them all together. That sounds kind of racist. Anyway, yeah. So this one we're doing is uh, Japan. So we're doing a lot of Japanese movies, um, and that we've been really been wanting to get around to some directors that we've been wanting to take a look at because there's such a, a vast um, amount of movies that mm -hmm. are available out there on streaming services and online to rent and everything that you can that you can find. In fact, I was telling you the other day um, I looked at my oh, old so Time Out book from 1989. Some of these films were even listed and then of course the newer ones of course they have yeah. been, they have been reviewed because they weren't available and parts to some of our wonderful friends at criterion you know they've been yeah. just churning out these japanese films like crazy and japan just particularly in the 40s 50s and 60s just i mean they still make great films yeah. but they went under had a, a renaissance after the world war ii where they just made amazing films for yes. you know for quite a while and so and i think part of this was spurred by we did the samurai episode and we just loved all those movies so yes. much we're like let's keep going let's just keep going with the japanese cinema yeah. so yeah all right so let's start with our first one which is 24 eyes a film i had not really heard of but when i looked up online as we sometimes do go one of the best japanese films of all time and this film shows up and i go i don't know what this is let me click on it and take a look and uh, this was directed by and i'm we're gonna butcher every name uh kisuka uh, kasuki kinoshi uh kin, kinoshita there we go and uh, who actually directed uh, a few other films that I had seen. He actually was very prolific, doing two or three films a year sometimes, and did all types of different genres. And his style actually isn't very, it doesn't really hit you over the head. I love Kurosawa, don't get me wrong, but his films are very easy to break down. His films are a little bit more subtle. Uh, kind of a little more along the lines of Ozu. And uh, when you watch some of them all together, you really get to see an amazing storyteller. So 24 Eyes is about a young uh, female teacher who comes to a small fishing village from the big city on the other side of the river, and uh, or the lake. And uh, she comes in and there's 24 eyes in, sense of, in, in terms of 12 students that she's teaching. And then we get to follow their lives uh, through World War II. Mm -hmm. And this is such a... A peaceful or, or, or quiet little film that just kind of shows this village. This village was chosen because it was based on a book because it wasn't touched by the war. And so you get to see the effects without actually having any bullets or bombs going off in there. So you get to see the effects of the people that are going off into war, the families mm -hmm. that are left behind. And it is an absolutely beautiful film. It was very well told and I absolutely, of all of these films, this is actually my favorite one of all of them. This one has stuck with me mm -hmm. the most. I love, love this movie. I know you did. You were. It's also kind of a tearjerker, oh, so I will warn yeah. you now. If you like a good melodrama or a good tearjerker, this is a good one to see. Um, and this is a good one for my parents out there who don't like a lot of the samurai movies. There's no samurais in this movie. Not a samurai to be had. <laughs> so uh, we can watch, review Japanese movies that don't have samurais. This is actually a wonderful, you know, uh, you know, drama that has, you know, the implications of the war. Um, you know, you see the lives of the children as they grow up and then their lives are changed by the war even though the war doesn't actually touch on their ground their Correct. their lives are still changed by and the teacher is a really interesting character because she is sort of a pass she's a pacifist she's really doesn't she you know she, in a time where it's very rah 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 you know the whole country is very nationalistic and um, mm -hmm. she's you know gets accused of you know um, while the war is going on of not being supportive and then later on people kind of see her perspective but they really appreciate what she did for them and I think that's the part that was really touching to me is as they're an adults they remember the role this teacher had in their lives and how she affected them with her ideas and her kindness and she takes them on a field trip into the city and gets them off the island and that really changes their lives and so I just love the humanistic feeling of this one so you it's know, a great film. The film was very popular in Japan because at the time after World War II they, you know, things kind of changed. People, families were upset they lost their sons they, they lost the war there's there was um, a lot of these things that you know what what was it all for and so this was you know a very again it's very in, in my feelings anyway very Japanese it's very subtle in, in terms of that um, message getting across um, but just the little things when she takes them on that 
uh, 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 tour or around, uh, you know, field, uh, trip, field yeah. trip, then some of the kids um, couldn't afford it, and so some of the, they couldn't go. Or some of the kids could afford it, but then they couldn't go to the school the rest of the year because they made the promises to someone, you know, for, to their parents that if they got this money for this trip, then they would just work in the fields the rest of the year or on the farm the rest of the year. Right. Um, there's when she is uh, ill and they, they bring her food, she goes to each of the village, to each of the families and thanks them and gets them mixed up with who brought it. And some families are like, we didn't bring you anything. And, and so she's very embarrassed. And of course, as we see through the, through the couple of decades, um, there's a present that's given at the end of this film that when I saw it coming, I thought, oh, please, please don't be what I think it's going to be. And, and it was, and it was very, very touching. And it, yeah, yeah. It, it gets me all, I right, always get all welled up because it was just, it's just so beautiful and it was just so well told. And, you know, she, it was just these lives that we got to interact with and some of them had lost. And it took us a while, mm -hmm. you know, to figure out which kid was which because there was so many of them. But it was, yeah, it's just a beautiful film. It's one of the reasons we go to the cinema, I think, yeah. to experience uh, humanity and all of its grace, I think, you know, yeah. in, in this way. So, yeah, definitely a beautiful movie oh so. it's so it's so worth finding yeah definitely a great one and I'd like to see more of his films I have not seen Battle of Nariyama which is Beautiful. another famous one he's done but he's done 50 odd films so and I know Criterion has a box set of some of his early 50s films including mm -hmm. Good Fairy and Broken Drum and some of his 40s films I also did in a separate box set so I mean he has quite a yeah. few films that are well regarded enough that Criterion put them out so I definitely would like to check those out Okay, so we'll move on to our next um, film, which is uh, from 1960, and it's When a Woman Ascends the Stairs uh, by the director Mikio Narus, and this is one I've been wanting to see for a long time. Uh, it's about a bar hostess who is faced with the dilemma of either finding a husband or opening her own business. Um, she is a bar hostess who's going further and further into debt, so she's sort of at the point in her life, and she's considered middle-aged by a Japanese society at the time. It's set probably in the early 50s or so. You know, she's probably like 30, but they're telling her she's going to be an old maid, you know, if she doesn't. So she has mm -hmm. to make a decision. And, um, you know, what's great about this film is it really explores the lives of women in post-war Japan in the post-World War II period where, you know, because of the economy has changed so much because of the war, you know, women are working. They're in the workforce, but they don't have the same opportunities men have. She's, you know, working her butt off, really. She's working all the time and just going into debt <laughs> by working because in order to be a bar hostess, you have to do all these favors for people and you have to try to bribe people people to come into the bar and you know they find this whole situation she's never able to get to that point where she can make enough money to support herself but yet she's too old quote unquote to find you know to be considered you know a marriage material or the men she does find are not really the greatest quality so it's a great film this is actually one of my favorites the one we mm. reviewed it's got some amazing cinematography the shots of her going up the stairs are just gorgeous um, there's yeah. a lot of interesting characters there's some heartbreaking things that happen throughout yeah. this film and the various people she interacts with there's some men that she meets that you really hope they turn out to be good guys and a lot of them don't <laughs> and that was really hard to watch um, you know this is a director who made 90 films in his career so some of these guys just make you feel like you're just a slacker <laughs> quite honestly like, what am I doing <laughs> with my life he made 90 films and mostly known for exploring the roles of women in contemporary Japanese society which is pretty cool so yeah, you know, it's the reason why she ascends those stairs, that, um, hence the, the title of the, of the right. film, of, of why she's doing that and, and how hard that is. Um, and she's smart. That's what I really like about, about her. Mm -hmm. She knows to stay away from some of these deals, even though it's kind of close to what she could, but maybe not that compromise. Is it going to be too much of a compromise? Mm -hmm. I don't want to necessarily do that. Then she's got some other younger workers who have gone off under, under their own, some other ones who are just taking advantage of, of the certain situations, and she's like, yeah, you think you're going to get this, and it's not actually going to be working out because right. you're going to be under this guy's thumb. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't yeah. it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't hit you over the head. It's there, again, but, um, you know, it, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to repeat things over for her to go, oh, no, I can't do this. Da, da, da. Sometimes it's a look. Sometimes it's her going, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, and then I'm walking away going, oh, okay, that's... Yeah, they have these deals, you know, where this man, you know, she wants to borrow... She's trying to figure out how she... She starts thinking, okay, I want to do the own my own business track because she's, you know, these options. The marriage isn't looking good. There's no good options out there. And then, you know, where is she going to get the money to open her own business because she doesn't have any money. Yep. And so, um, you know, there's various deals she's looking at, and you can see on the surface of a lot of them that they're not good. There's no... Yep. You know, they don't have, like, a small business loan association, apparently, at the time, at least, where she could go to the bank and get a loan. It was sort of like, you know, doing deals with different people all of which seem pretty shady so yeah no I thought it was a really fascinating movie and then there's this young man who's really interested in her you know and he's he's interested in her 
Um, and you kind of think maybe there's going to be a love story there, but it goes in interesting directions, and it's not quite. I forgot to write her name down, but uh, um, she was the lead. Uh, she's an actually, it's a Fantastic. great performance. Fantastic, and she's performance. been in quite a few uh, films, actually, yeah. yeah. an amazing performance. There's also uh, Tatsuya Nakad Nakadia, um, who's a, a famous uh, actor who's actually been in a lot of different films. I thought I kept recognizing him going, hey, you know, I've seen that guy. He's done a lot of um, uh, Kurosawa films working along with Mifune and, and some of his films. And we're also going to be, our next film is actually going to be, have, is going to star him in it as well. But it's, a, it's a, a great cast in this film. And again, with this director, it's just kind of, you know, it's not like he just holds the camera still. It's not that he isn't afraid to move the camera or he does move the camera a lot. It's just letting the story kind of unfold and just being mm -hmm. a storyteller. Very a lot subtle. of times, you know, and that just isn't, you know, directing isn't just moving the camera or where you put the camera and how that's going to be. Sometimes it's just letting the, the story breathe, working with the pacing of it and letting it just kind of happen. You know, something with 24 eyes, you can easily tell there's going to be a big path because we're going to see her later down with the line with the kids as adults and see how that, you know, their, child, their, their education affects affected them. This one is, you know, you, you don't know how it's going to end. You're right. wondering about that and you're wondering if it's we're going to end on her ascending those stairs or if it's going to be a different type of situation that's going to happen. Both of these films are really uh, absolutely wonderful, beautiful black and white, so you got to find them um, and look for them and enjoy. Both four-star films, I would yes. say, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right about the subtlety. I think that's, you know, for folks that haven't discovered the joys of Japanese cinema of this period, um, it is subtle. It's not for everyone. If you just like fast-paced action movies and you have no attention span, these are going to be hard to sit through. Because they are, you know, humanistic stories that take their time to tell stories. They do not say that they're boring. I think they're fascinating and gorgeous. But, um, but you know, but I like that they do that, that they, and that they don't go for obvious things, like you said. Like, you know, it might be just a look or that you can tell she's thinking this is a bad deal. She doesn't come out and go, well, that was a bad deal, you know, yeah. or, you know, so it doesn't. Because of this. Yeah, it doesn't have it. to, you know, spell it all out for you. So, and it's something that's missing in a lot of contemporary films at times. So. Kind of nice seeing a, a lady leads in a movie. Yeah, and I also like that, of course, bit. too. Just a little bit. Yeah. No, I mean, it was kind of nice. I mean, that's not how I see it, and, and to see what's in it, but, but uh, it was. We well, were looking at the had, films going, wow, both of these have And I really like the way he or, framed it in terms of all the other women who had made that decision or not, like the one woman who did go into business for herself and had very tragic yeah. results. Yeah. There's another one who's very successful. You know, so she's got different options. She's just trying to, but she doesn't have a lot of options, and I think that's the main point he's trying to drive home is this is your own, she has got two options, and neither of them are very good in this case, you know. So. And you also learn a lesson on how to get new companies kimonos or at least new to you kimonos by someone whose business has failed they'll sell them and then you can buy them yeah or when they die at a discount you can get them at yeah. a discount yeah oh god <laughs> just that alone she was like yeah look at this isn't it great i thought oh no it's <laughs> broken dreams because oh, they were giving her dream. they were giving her a hard time because her kimono was looking too old and you can't yeah. be a bar hostess and you know have your old kimono that the men have seen over and over so yeah that was interesting very interesting okay so Oh, switching major gear is a very different type of movie. Um, our next uh, film is from 1966, and it's The Sword of Doom um, by Kihachi Akamoto. And this is about a vengeful samurai who leaves a pile of bodies in his wake. And if that sounds simplistic, that's because that is pretty much what the movie is about. And it's about so eventually getting his comeuppance as the brother uh, of a man he, he kills starts to count, starts to plot his revenge against him with the help of, of course, the great Toshiro Mifune, Yay. who's in a very small role here, but a very, very essential. Too small. Too small. But it is. There are no small roles. There are no small roles, only small actors. Is that the. No? I don't know. Small anyway. Screens, I don't so this director. Uh, um, Akimoto made 40 films, including Kill and Zatotoichi yes. meets Yojimbo, and he yes. is more known for this style, like action type movies. Samurai little, Assassin as well. Samurai Assassin. Yeah. So he's into these action uh, campier movies. This movie is super stylized. This is actually the opposite of the two we just talked about. Where we were like subtle and you take time to get to know the characters. Like the main samurai here, you know, we don't even know. Um, we know a little bit he's got some daddy issues. That's about all we get. But we don't really know why he's so vengeful. He doesn't even know why. He just he just wants to kill everybody he meets. You don't really get a lot of backstory here. Yeah, I think the sword, the sword of doom speaks to him, and that's the loudest voice that he has in his head. This is a guy who just knows how to kill. 
Right. And that's what he really enjoys doing. And that's what he's good at. He loves pretending, I don't really know how to do this. Can you show me how to do this? Or, or he's trying to figure out and plot constantly when he sees another samurai. He immediately starts measuring up to see how, what, what kind of style do you use? How do you do it? I know how to counter that. I can, you know, I can best this guy. Mm -hmm. And there's a it's great scene. It's like the only scene, thing he's good at. He the great scene at the beginning of the film is where he's challenged by someone else, and they they know that this other guy is very upset with him, and they might challenge him to a duel instead of just a kind of, um, you know, a, a showing of styles. And his wife comes. This, this the other gentleman's wife comes to him and says, "Listen, I'll do you a favor." Come to my room sometime. I'll do you a favor so you don't kill my husband. <laughs> and uh, so you don't kill my husband. <laughs> and so he does. And but the other guy, it immediately becomes a duel. And the you know man takes a charge at him, and he kills him in one quick swift. And, and then that's it. And so the woman then goes off with him because now she's she's shamed herself. She can't live in that society. She's got to go with him. And there's a, another great scene in this film where they go and they attack Toshiro Mifune's um, uh, um. character and he's a part of this bandit and he sees Mifune come out with the sword and wow, it is good. And he shook. I mean, at one point in time, he kind of starts to pull his, like the Zetatuchi movies where you kind of pull your, your sword a little bit and that reacts everybody. It's kind of like click, it's kind of like pulling the little hammer back on You're the gun. gun yeah. It's like that, they flick it with their thumb. And he kind of starts to, but then he's totally intimidated and it shakes him. And that's why he kind of loses it. Now, this ending of this film, I'm not going to give anything away, but the ending of the film is very abrupt. We start to come where everything is coming together and I'm like, ooh, this is going to be good. This is going to be like, good. Felix is just getting going at the ending. I mean, it you know. goes and off into another direction and then credits and I went, wait. Hey, I didn't get the resolution that I really wanted and it really bothered me and I was thinking about giving this one a three and a half stars but the more time passed the more I kind of enjoyed that because you know what if they would have wrapped everything up in a bow which I do enjoy sometimes right. I kind of go yeah but they wrapped everything up in a bow you can't make the critic happy so I enjoyed that that was the style right, right, that right, right, yeah. But at that last, oh gosh. But well, when it ended, it, you and minutes? I both went like, what? Oh, I, what? what? But I mean, Where's it's like the a, movie? Where's the end? It's like yeah. a 10 minute fight at the end. And I mean, Oh, yeah. Everybody. And you want to talk about, so if you're a Tarantino yeah, Carol, fan, yeah, Kill Bill. if you have watched the Kill Bill this. movies, yeah. you need to watch this movie. That's yeah. just, that's it. Because you will see, you will watch it and go, oh my God. And you will not, you will see so many scenes that were just stolen directly into Kill Bill. I mean, the, the, yeah. the ending, that when I was watching it, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going through room after room yeah. and fighting every single guy with the sword. It reminded me so much of the big fight scene in Kill Bill. It was crazy. But it was very cool, though. I like that they had some, you know, they had some duels yeah. that were going to be happening. Some do happen, some necessarily don't, some are avoiding. And so then you kind of like, wait. And, you know, again, we, you know, you know, our conversation's going, wait a minute, wasn't he, the next day, wasn't they supposed to be the, oh, 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 no, someone skipped town. Oh, okay. Without telling you exactly yeah, what Yeah, the timeline's happening. a little so bit. But this isn't a movie that. where you can get too, you can't get too um, obsessed with like, oh, you know, things that narrative stuff, you know. This is really about the action and the style. And, and this this actor, Tetsuya Nakadia, he also has done, I've seen him, you know, in this movie, he's a crazed killer. I've also seen him being, you know, um, kind of the, you know, responsible uh, character. I've seen him in Kill, where it's a comedic character, and he's kind of the all-knowing kind of Jimbo character. Big range. I've seen him play character. a businessman in several yeah. films, too. Yeah, really, really good actor. I didn't recognize him because, I mean, he is devilish in this film. Until oh, yeah. he cracks up to that point, he's not afraid to take anybody on. And when he goes for that sword, it's scary. And at that one point in time where he's with his wife, and... She pushes things too far, or he goes over the edge, and he starts to go after her. You're like, oh no, we're we're gonna go here. This is where we're gonna go. It, it goes, it goes very everywhere. Surprising. Yeah, no, so, it's uh, a pretty, it's a pretty um, daring film, I would say, for '66. There's a, yeah, yeah, it's definitely fun, and it's action packed. So you know, forgetting what I said earlier about like, oh, if you, you know, if you could watch this, if you still have the, you know, I need action constantly, you could watch this one. Well, it works so. as a, you can run them as a double feature if you want to have one that's nice and subtle, and then you can have that's the ending. Because the second that. movie in a double feature has got to be a little bit more pop to keep you that's awake. That's true. You couldn't you do 24 have it the other hour, way hour. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. do it when a woman's, we watch no. these all separately, but we, you know, we couldn't do when a woman sends the stairs maybe and 24 eyes in one setting. Well, 24 eyes is also fairly long. It's you like can, but that hours. second movie is uh, it's a little harder to do that. You yeah. need to have a little movie that's But yeah, quicker. Sword of Doom, it just moves right along. I don't remember the length, but it seemed like it zipped right on by. It, I could tell it zipped on by. 98 minutes, Angela's happy. Well, no, I can describe I could tell it, it zipped by when Boom. I'm 
going, oh, I could have used a little more at the end because I was, yeah, you know, yeah, a little bit abrupt. But then I read online when I was reading on this film because this is another criteria. I, Actually, know, I think I every my own single. Opinions, Andrew. I don't know why you're doing this. Well, I was just reading. no. I wanted to read all better, but later you read essays. You read the essay on criteria. I read the essay on twenty-four hours first. Because why do they consider it as a classic? Because it was like it was such a subtle film. I'm like, I don't. There's any big shots. This is just a nice, quiet story. And then when you read about, oh, it was people's changing opinion, and that's why it was such a popular book. You can see film. why it's considered a classic because you loved it. it oh you well, yeah, but it wasn't very. Yeah, whatever they pulled together, and I'm wiping my eyes. Sure, yeah, sure. yeah. But most of these films are on Criterion. But my point, um, what was I trying to get to? Oh, it's a, it was supposed to be originally a sequel um, yeah. to the film, and it never happened. Oh, so that's why it left. It, it ends on totally a cliffhanger. Totally could do that. Yeah. They could do it now. Maybe someone else will pick it. Well, it'd be yeah, you weird. CGI on some actor, make him look like him, and there it is. A, yeah, it'll be oh. kind of weird. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, yeah very entirely. different. I think that all the other ones are Criterion, except for our very last one that you're going to yeah. talk about. So. We ready for that one? Yeah, I think so. I So far, I've given everything four. I think this is going to be a four-star episode, personally. <laughs> no, no, it is. A four-star episode. Well, let's put, pat ourselves on the back yes. after the uh, camera no, stuff. No, a lot of four-star movies. So our next film is actually 2006. Yay, see, we can do it. And it's in color. There you go. Um, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Love and Honor, uh, directed by Yoji Yamata, who also did Twilight Samurai. <sighs> I love that movie. I, know I you really love that movie. I really love that film. So if you haven't seen that one, we reviewed it a couple weeks, a few episodes back. Check that one out. And this one, actually, there's different levels of samurai. Not all of them are going out there and. Uh, some of them actually work there at the... <laughs> That's it, your it, impression of a samurai. <laughs> some of them work in the fortress. And this guy literally is the bean counter. He is the guy who takes inventory of the food, of the beans and, and no, the rice. No, that's Twilight and Samurai. No, this one in Love and Honor. He's oh, excuse me, excuse me. You're right. The Love and Honor. He is. You're, this I'm like one, you're mixing up your movies. That was Twilight yeah. Samurai. Sorry. Love and this Honor. This is Love and Honor. Worse, his worse. job. Yeah. Okay, okay, go ahead. His job at the fortress. He's actually one of the food tasters. So he's not always just going out there. He's the one that actually gets to eat the food. And uh, poison gets through, and he actually becomes blind from being poisoned by doing this job. Now, because he has now lost his job, um, they're worried and concerned about his family and how they're going to be able to afford everything. So his wife makes a deal with the fellow politician. Yeah, that kind of a deal, folks. And so now the family has to, and now he has to also live with this decision, and so does she. And um, this is, a, yet That's again. That's the love and, and honor, yeah. This is the love and honor. And this is such an incredible film. Not only are they dealing with that situation, but we get to meet other people, the other people in this community, the other people that are working with them, that are that are know them. And we get to see all these very interesting characters that kind of come in. And, uh, well, yeah, you know, because he's gone blind, we need to do something for him. Let me talk to this person, and I'll do this, and this is what's going to happen here. And so we get to see a lot of the political dealings mm -hmm. here with a lot of the people, as well as just this heartbreak of this decision that was made and what was what was done to, to help everybody out and it was it's just heartbreaking it really really right. is I couldn't figure out why he lost his job. I mean, I'm sure it seemed like they had a very strict, I mean, it was basically maybe in that time period, you know, once you were blind, you were done, you were useless, you couldn't do anything because that's the way they treat him. Yeah. They're like, oh, you're you're done. There's no working for you. You're a samurai who's blind. It's like, well, he was a samurai who was a taste tester who just sat on the floor and ate food. He could do that blind. In fact, it might even heighten his sense of taste. Now, I'm not saying you would want to once you've been poisoned and you might be a little reluctant to go back to that job. Yeah. But it was funny how they were merely like, well, he can't do that job anymore. I'm like, why? There's no reason he couldn't still taste food just because he's blind. But anyway, that was just more my logical brain thinking. But a really interesting story how in both of these films, Twilight Samurai and now this one, the same director, he's really focused on not the, the glamorous samurai that we've seen in other films, not the sword wielding ones. No, not this the is ones, like the working, the the working, working samurais. Class. I yeah, love they're this. like the Yeah, the, literally the other it's guy so counted beans all day and this guy taste test food yeah. for the real, you know, the upper echelon yeah. people. He's, you I know, they're, they're poor characters that are barely making it. They're just making just enough to support their household and that's about it. They're really on the edge economically and I love and I'm really curious because this is part of a trilogy he did and we haven't seen the the third one in the trilogy and I'm really curious if the third one's similar and that it's focused on these working class characters because it's a real dilemma and in uh, both films Twilight Samurai and this one the wives are just or the love interests are these just really wonderful women who are really whole hearted you know really want the best for their guys under tough circumstances you know the wife in this film maybe she doesn't do the best thing but she thinks she's doing the best thing she can it's and she feels like she's being encouraged she by his family who mm -hmm. are used to them having a certain lifestyle and don't want them to shame the family name by going into poverty so 
But they're also Pretty kind of shamed in a way because of now his new handicap that's happening along that's happening there. And so that's always Which really is interesting. Not his and fault. some it's come by, yeah. His fault, but it happened. You People know. are coming. You know, the ants coming by. No, see how are you doing? Oh, here's a little bit of money. And I'm like, no, no, this is we don't. If he doesn't have his job anymore, this isn't going to help. I mean, it's, right. you know, that's not going to help. Yeah, I guess they didn't have workers' there. comp back then. And in addition to that, you know, <laughs> they make him feel like he should be grateful that they don't kick him out of the house because the house is also owned by the royalty, yeah. and you know, it's owned by the king or whatever they had, you know, and the emperor. And so technically, he's, you know, it's not even his property. But they're like, well, you know, since you did your, you know, he him such a service with taste testing that food, we'll let you keep you the did house. Same, you know. Well, yeah. you know, then there's, you, you know, uh, without giving too much away, there, the, the, the story does progress, and at the ending, uh, you know. I, I really enjoyed um, what had happened there and how they kind of put the, how they put put things together um, in terms of some conversations happening and with the politicians and certain things come to come to light that well yeah of course sure you know these things that happen without giving I don't want to give them too much away but I, I really don't want to concentrate just so much on the the downtrodden and the horrible thing that's happened to this poor man but um, at the ending I really enjoyed also- that there. Just like in Twilight Summer, there's a romance, and there's a romance in this one, too. And I like the way that in both movies, and you don't see this a lot in samurai films, or really in a lot of Japanese films of this period in general, um, the relationship, you know, they have conversations, you know, even before she does what she does, she's talking to him, like, talk to me, I'm your wife, you know, like, we're supposed to share everything. And, you know, in Twilight Summer, it was very much the same way with the love interest in that movie. She wanted him to talk to her and open up, and there was a lot of discussions between them, you know, the great scene in Twilight Summer, where she's doing his hair and um, so there you know he really likes to dwell on these little moments between two people and I like that that's very real and very humanistic and and uh, when he has uh, the, the, the the food dish there at the end that was really really good I didn't get all misty but it was a part of me it was just like oh please <laughs> Come on. I want a happy ending or I don't want a happy ending it's hard talking about films when you have a happy ending and, and or they don't have a happy ending and how you want to to explain balance that. Balance that. Well, it just yeah, has, to be, to, so it has to be the right ending. It has to be the right ending, ending for that movie. Well, I always want but, the best for the characters. You know, I really like them, but then it's, you know, that's not true. It's funny because these are some of the newer films we've reviewed. You know, Twilight Samurai, when we did the Samurai episode, and this one with Love and Honor, Yoji Yamada, the director, he's done 85 films. Again, these guys are not slacking off. <laughs> he's still alive. <laughs> he started in the 30s. I mean, he's born in the 30s. He's still making movies. He had one just out just last year. Yeah. And uh, he's cranking out still one or two a year still. So it's incredible. I just... It's, That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, well, that's not hard to wrap this one up there. So, uh, lots of great films. plenty of films. Ah, yeah, lots of great films. Uh, 24 Eyes, When a Woman Ascends the Stairs, The Sword of Doom, The Sword of Doom, and uh, Love and Honor. Uh, as always, uh, you can like us on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, you can listen to us on KMUZ, and you can watch us on YouTube or on our actual web, our, our Real Film Snobs website. You can also submit a viewer's pick. Don't forget to do that. If you want to thank our amazing sponsors, sponsors and our fantastic crew, and of course you for watching, have a great day and great movies. <laughs>